Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this June 29th, 2016 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can listen to my show every evening from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. at specific time on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. They also play the show at 11 a.m. Thanks a lot, First Amendment. They play it at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And, of course, if you can't get my show uh, during those two times, you can get reruns at ARCTICBEACON.com. It's uh, my long standing website for over a decade where I specifically talk about the Vatican led New World Order. And I like to uh, describe it that way because that's really the appropriate way to do it. And the mainstream media, of course, covers up those first two words, Vatican led. And I found that much of the alternative media does the same thing. And that's why my show has been called The Alternative to the Alternative Media. And that nickname was given to me years ago. Uh, but anyway, if you want to get the whole story, truth starts here on the Investigative Journal. My guest today is Deborah Andrasek of the Alamo Ministry. And uh, for those of you, I'm going to give you just about a minute introduction if you haven't heard of the Alamo Ministry. If you listen to my show, you should know every aspect about it because they've been targeted by the Vatican-led New World Order for their Christian views as well as outing the Vatican's real power in, geopolitic, in the geopolitical arena. And this has been going on for 40 years. Now, I'd make three statements, and then we'll move on to Deborah, what she wants to do today. First of all, Tony Alamo, the pastor, has been jailed illegally. Uh, the charges are completely bogus, and I've uh, showed so much evidence to prove that. And he sits in jail uh, right now, and he shouldn't be there. Secondly, they've taken uh, many of the children, and I call it state kidnapping, stating that uh, the children were in danger. I found out over the years this is really a fabrication, and it was a way to disband this ministry. And all those kids should be given back to their, uh, their parents, and they haven't. State kidnapping, right there. Thirdly, they've tried to take away all their property, and it's a three-prong approach, and they now in civil court on many different cases, and we've discussed that. We don't have time today to go into it, but go to my website if you want to find out. One of the, uh, they tried, uh, they took away, or they are taking away, the Arkansas property, which was the largest uh, civil settlement in Arkansas's history. Can you believe that? And it gets very little coverage. If it does get coverage, it gets coverage from a slanted point of view, and uh, I've tried to point that out on my show. Well, anyway, Deborah's with me today, and Deborah's been with the ministry for over 40 years, and today she wants to specifically talk about recent comments that Pope Francis has made. Uh, Deborah, how are you today? <laughs> oh, I'm just doing great. How are you doing? Good. It's good to have you on the show. And I know you. you're very. You want to spend this hour talking about what the Pope recently stated. So go ahead, and uh, the floor is all yours. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to start out in a biblical framework here and just mention that there is an Antichrist spirit, and it's been alive in the world ever since, uh, actually, the Garden of Eden when Satan first deceived the, uh, Adam and Eve there. And it's prevalent in Rome, Italy, and I'd like, and around the world, and mm -hmm. I'd like to say that I'm talking about the Vatican Catholic Church right now, and I want to let everybody know that it isn't a church. It's a militant, political, world-controlling organization disguised as the Church of Jesus Christ. Okay. It's actually Satan's church. And I'd like to go to this press conference that uh, Pope Francis had on Sunday. Uh, he was in an airplane on a flight back to Rome after his weekend trip to Armenia. And he said, and I quote, I believe that the church not only must say it's sorry to this person that is gay that it has offended, but it must say it's sorry to the poor also to mistreated women and to children forced to work. Okay, at this point, I'd like to just mention that, <laughs> I mean, to say you're sorry is just so crazy. 
when this man opens his mouth, he speaks blasphemies against God, and he speaks blasphemies against uh, uh, anything that's holy. And if anybody needs to apologize, and as if an apology would be sufficient, I would like to say that there are historians that estimate that 50 million people were killed in the Middle Ages by the papacy for being heretics, which essentially is not agreeing with the Church of Rome and not joining the Church of Rome and being under the Pope's control. Uh, and if that number seems too high, you have to remember that the Inquisition is still going on. And uh, in Revelation 18.24, it specifically states that it doesn't call it the Vatican, but it's easy to put two and two together. In the Vatican is found the blood of prophets and saints and all that were slain upon the earth. So how, how do you apologize for something like that? That is their history. But I'd like to go into, in a scriptural way, and just talk about uh, what he has said that we Christians have to do. And I, I've seen several articles where the, the word Christian comes first. Christians and the Roman church has to apologize. Well, the Christians don't have to apologize for anything. Jesus never apologized. Jesus didn't say, uh, hey, hey, you know, people, I made some laws back in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, I'm changing it. It's not that way anymore. Jesus never said that. He didn't apologize to anybody. His word is true. You can depend on it. The whole world is framed by the word of God. God opened his mouth and spoke, and he created everything. And I, uh, this man goes on to say, he says, I will repeat the same thing I said on the first trip. This is Pope Francis. Okay, go ahead. He, sa he says, I will also repeat what the catechism of the Catholic Church says. That and then in brackets, gay people should not be discriminated against, that they have to be respected, pastorally accompanied. And I'd like to read out of the Roman Catechism what it actually uh, says there and what he, he's actually going against his own catechism. Uh, now, this is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Part 3, Life in Christ, Article 6, the Sixth Commandment. And it begins, male and female, he created them. And then I'm going to skip on down to number two, 2357, and I'm going to quote what he says. He says, uh, or what the catechism says, basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as acts of grave depravity. And then there's a footnote, and uh, the footnote cites scriptures which I'll read in a few minutes. Uh, it says, tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. They are contrary to the natural law. Dot, dot, dot. Under no circumstances can they be approved. Now, in the footnotes, uh, they cite specifically Genesis 19, 1 through 29, which is the whole account of Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened there, and that can be read in, in their Bible as well as the uh, King James Version of the Bible. And and then the second one that it cites is uh, chapter 1 of Romans uh, 26 and 27. Actually, they include 24 through 27. I'll just say 26 through 27, and it says, God gave them up, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. And then they cite 1 Corinthians uh, 6.10, and uh, I'll read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, dot, 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 nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, dot, 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 shall inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, and then the final one that they do is 1 Timothy 1, 10, I'll read 9 and 10, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but dot, 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 for them that defile themselves with mankind. 
Okay, so they are quoting scriptures out basically out of the New Testament besides the, the Sodom and Gomorrah account in the Old Testament. But there's several more in the Old Testament which uh, I can cite. I won't read them, but Leviticus 20.13, Deuteronomy 23.17, Deuteronomy 23.18 also. And I'd like to say that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. He's not, he's not a man that he will lie, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Those are two scriptures that uh, I have taken right out of, out of the Bible. Uh, one of, is from Hebrews, and the other is from, I believe, the book of Malachi. And anyway, God does not change. He's the same. Well, you know and something, not, Deborah, if I could just break in here. Uh, one sure. thing that I wanted to, to say is that, you know, this could be a touchy subject. And what happens is people may listen to this and go, oh, well. Greg's bringing on somebody that's racist against homosexuals or something like this, or Greg's talked this way in the past. But here's the way I look at it, and uh, maybe you could explain yourself too so people uh, understand. God, if we look at it from strictly God's law, okay, instead of man's law and all the propaganda political things they do with homosexuality uh, for an agenda that has nothing to do with God's law, we all start out equal in God's eyes as sinners, no matter if you're white or you're black or whatever. Everyone starts out even. And what he's done is laid out a path for your sins to be forgiven. And this is the area that the Vatican, I think, tries to, uh, to really sway people into Satan's world, not God's. So... We're not being racist here at all towards homosexuals. Go ahead. Well, first of all, they do not offer repentance. They will tell you that you can, by prayer or whatever, you can overcome the sin of homosexuality. You cannot overcome any sin, whether it be murder or lying or stealing or anything at all, unless you have the Lord Jesus Christ living in you. And that's accomplished by, the Bible says you must be born again, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, accepting him into your heart, accepting the blood atonement. The only way, which is the blood, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, asking him to come into your heart and to forgive your sins and, and to have those sins washed away in the blood. And then the Holy Spirit will enter a human being. It doesn't matter if you're a homosexual, an adulterer, a fornicator, whatever the sin is or that the Lord Jesus Christ can forgive it and he can give these people power over this. The point that I am trying to make is that this is a militant organization with an agenda and that they have uh, control of the media and they they say all these evil things against God and then they say and then this, this man goes on to say uh, he says this is the life of the church. We are all saints because we all have the Holy Spirit inside us, but we are also all sinners. This is a horrible blasphemy. You cannot be a saint and a sinner at the same time. Mm -hmm. you, Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. You, you can't. Jesus sets before us death and life, and you have to choose either death or life, and that's just the way it is. Uh, I've got some scriptures here. Go ahead. Uh, in, Joshua 24 says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, dot, dot, dot. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. Uh, either he will hate the one and love the other or hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon simply means wealth or riches. And it's uh, if it's personified, it means the God of riches. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. See, the world doesn't see or know the Holy Spirit. You can only receive the Holy Spirit after you're saved and washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And... Uh, you have to keep that Holy Spirit within you by reading his word on a daily basis. People are deceived because they don't read the Bible. So 
they're open to letting these popes and any other false religious leader tell them different things that the Bible says, and it's not true. And and also then this man goes on to say, uh, he says, who are we to judge them? Well, who are we to judge them? The Bible is the Bible's clear. He says the catechism's clear. The Bible is clear. The Bible says uh, it, there's specific things where it, it allows us to judge by the word of God. A saint, uh, somebody that's saved can judge by the word of God because Jesus is the word of God and he, his are the words of life. So in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, 2 and 3, it says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So you can, anybody, the least esteemed in your congregation can pick up a Bible and go to the scriptures and say that homosexuality is wrong, as well as adultery or fornication or any stealing, any other sin. And, and also John seven twenty four it says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So we, we can judge all things by the word of God, but they'll always say, don't judge. Well, according to the Bible, we can judge. And the thing of it is, when people die, if they're not right with God, their souls are going to spend eternity in hell and the lake of fire. And I want to go back to the fact that this church is not a church it's a cult and it's a militant organization and in her is found the blood of all that were slain on the earth and it's still doing the inquisition it's still uh behind the scenes the vatican controls everything it controls the world food supply through their codex alimentarius based in rome italy it can it controls everything there it, there is nothing that's not under its wing and uh, it's that way because the Bible says that in the last days there will be a one world government, a global government. And why did God say it? Because he looked out into eternity. He looked out into the future and he saw that these things, because of man's rebellion against God, that this is the way things would happen. And it's exactly what has happened. So and then we have uh, John Paul who said, don't go to God for forgiveness of your sins. Come to me. Come to John Paul for forgiveness. He has no power to forgive sins. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can forgive sins and only through his precious blood that he shed. So basically that's what I wanted to say in refuting what this man has recently said. He said many, many things that are ungodly and unscriptural and people just really don't know. And this whole homosexual agenda is being pushed on people through the television and movies and it's just and through radio but specifically through visuals and uh yeah and i was so and i was going to ask you why do you think uh, that's going on why do you think the pope is making such a big point of, about this issue is it to destroy uh, a godly life what's your thinking of God and homosexuality is exactly the opposite of God's plan for uh, a man and a woman. In the beginning, God created a man and a woman. It says so in their own catechism. Uh, it goes back to uh, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. God gave rulership to Adam and Eve and uh, they gave it away to Satan and now Satan's got the rule. But the thing about uh, this homosexual agenda is that it, as you will know very well, the Catholic Church is has been raping little boys and little girls, but primarily I'm talking about little boys here. It's their church. It's what they do. It's they've covered it up. Uh, they've covered it up for centuries. But that's what they do. It's well known. It's documented. You can you can see it uh, on the internet. You can go back to different documentation. You can see all the vileness of it. So they really have to cover up, especially now, what they're doing. They have to get it legalized so that it's okay and they're not looked upon as as the homosexual church, which is what they are. They're the homosexual church. I mean, you know, this this response from Pope Francis was was in regard 
reference to something that, uh, what was this man? Uh, he was responding to a question about remarks that German Cardinal Reinhard Marx made last week that the Catholic Church should apologize to the gay community for marginalizing them. Well, I mean, it's pretty obvious they're coming out with their cardinals, their popes. They they want to have they they want everything to be covered up. They've had to pay a lot of money out to different people for all the offenses they've committed against these uh, young men and boys, and child rape and assault and everything else that they've done. So that's one thing. But it's just also that it's it's totally against Christ, against God, and that's the way Satan is, and that's his that's his nature. That's his uh, that's the way Satan is. And that's what he wants the world to be like him. Totally well you know you've been you've been at this for a while. I mean looking at uh, the Vatican from two different points of view, one from a spiritual point of view and also what they do in the world. Uh, can you see, we got about three minutes and then we'll get into this more in the second half, but many people have said that there, we're reaching a point now where the Pope is getting into every bit of our life. He's trying to do things that seem unconstitutional in our country and he seems to be professing things that are non-biblical and being very outspoken about it. Uh, do you think this has any, uh, do you think this is a sign that the one world order, which I mean by the one world government and one world religion are getting closer and we could even see it in our lifetime? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We're right here. It's here. And I'm, I don't know uh, who the Antichrist is specifically, which, uh, but I, it's coming right out of the Vatican. And uh, yeah, this is happening right in our time. We're there. We're so close to the end. So many of the signs have been fulfilled. I don't know how long we have, but uh, it's it's to where you can't preach the gospel out in the open. If you're uh, going out on the streets and preaching the gospel and, and uh, you get a crowd around you, uh, I'm sure you get some police that are going to come over and find out what you're doing. And preaching the gospel is something that our, our country was founded on in the very beginning. Well, yeah, and I've, I've always said this, that uh, when you really look at, uh, if you begin to speak up against the Vatican, pretty soon they say that's hate speech. Secondly, if you begin to point out biblically that homosexuality is not a normal lifestyle, and it should not be legalized, uh, or even re uh, looked at as a minority, and even taught in schools, and uh, this, you know, the old things they're doing, you, basically what you can uh, expect is... Uh, Police uh, saying, you know, public officials saying that's hate speech. These people uh, shouldn't be doing this. You're going to get harassment from the police from your point of view as a ministry doing it. But I've even looked at it from the point of view of people like I, I remember there was a baseball player uh, named Kurt Schilling, and he was announcer for C e e ESPN, and he made some really uh, contradictory statements towards homosexuality, and he was a, he's a He's a Christian, and he was fired. They will not accept any kind of Christian value, uh, and they called it uh, hate speech. They made him even apologize, and then, uh, you know, basically he lost his job, and he they gave him a second chance, and he said something else, and now they won't talk to him. But you see how it just spreads out all over the place. And, uh, yes, it does. You know, and that's kind of what I want to talk about. We're about out of time in the first half hour. Then we can specifically get, uh, I want to get back to a few of those statements he really did make uh, recently and a couple others that I'll bring up. Uh, back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app. For all of your mobile devices, streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now.
The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Okay, we're back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal on this June 29th, 2016 day on our calendar. My guest is Deborah Andrasek, and she's from the Alamo Ministry. And if you're familiar with my show, you can go back almost 10 years when I first interviewed Tony Alamo, the pastor, and spent many hours talking about him and how I found out about Tony. And let me just do this before we bring Deborah back, uh, was when I lived in uh, Rome and was a reporter there. I happened to be there during the Vatican Bank scandal in the 80s, and that's how I really learned what the Vatican was all about. I, at that time, was not, uh, basically, you might as well call, I was probably an atheist when I was there. Uh, and I happened to be in Rome, and I, was, I grew up as a Catholic, but when I saw the corruption, when I was there actually to see with my own eyes, uh, my whole world changed. And You've, you've seen many of my shows talking about the things that happened to me in Rome and how I almost was in a terrorist attack and killed, etc., etc., and then happened to cover the Vatican with Cardinal Marchinkas when he was the Vatican Bank president and saw the scandals, and that's how I learned about it. And so when I came, how I found out about the Alamo Ministries, when I returned to America years later, I started looking for people that understood this in this country, and I found there weren't very many. One was Tony Alamo, and boy, did I have to go through uh, things to figure this out, because I looked at every article on the newspaper. Everything was slandering this guy, slandering these people, and I said, who were they? And you know what? If I wasn't in Rome and saw how they operated and understood what they did there, I'd have never believed anything that these people told me. But over the years, I've come to understand them and report the truth about them, and I will do that forever because this story shows you there is no freedom of religion in this country any longer or speech. And so 
what I wanted to do before I get back to uh, Deborah, and she can listen and comment on this, but since I started out talking about the Vatican and talking about money and finances, let's uh, Friday I'm going to have on John Levy, an attorney who has sued the Vatican numerous times uh, regarding uh, stolen, Ill, ill-gotten gains from things like the genocide in World War II uh, during, uh, in Czechoslovakia. And listen to this article he sent me from his law office, and uh, he'll be on Friday to comment. And Deborah, I think you'll find this interesting, because this pope is really making some outlandish statements here. Listen to this. And this is from John Levy, who wrote this from his law office. And he wanted people to realize what was going on. He said this, Cardinal George Pell, who is Vatican pre- Prefect of the Secretariat for the Economy. Did you realize they have people with names like this? They sound like a, um, a government, not a, not a Christian church. Uh, told the tablet, a Catholic newspaper, on June 17, 2016, that's only a few days ago, that, quote, the Vatican is committed to transparency, international cooperation, and the use of contemporary international standards in financial reporting. Cardinal Pell further praised Jean-Baptiste de Franceau, the director of the Vatican Bank, as one who had done an excellent clean-out job, in quotes. Pell further stated Pope Francis continues to insist that the financial reforms must continue. Nowhere in Pell's message, however, says John Levy, was there any mention of the Nazi-linked Eustachia Treasury, first identified by the U.S. State Department in 1998 as a suspicious World War II-era transaction involving gold and other valuables looted from Serbian, Jewish, and Roma victims of a huge holocaust where hundreds of thousands of people were killed in former Yugoslavia, with priests actually doing the murdering and deposited at, and the money from all of this being deposited at the Vatican Bank for safekeeping. The Eustachia Treasury was the subject of a decade-long lawsuit against the Vatican Bank by our offices and the Holocaust survivors and resulted for in the four-day testimony of former U.S. Special Agent William Gowan, who investigated a mysterious 10-truck treasure t- convoy that unloaded its contents at St. Peter's Square in 1946. The lawsuit, however, was dismissed here on the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco on jurisdictional grounds. A later inquiry by this office into the European Commission resulted in a referral to the Vatican Financial Intelligence Unit, which resisted all efforts by Holocaust survivors that I represent to force an inquiry. This office has filed a canon law petition with the Vatican in an attempt to compel Cardinal Pell, and this is going on as we speak, to do his job and audit the bank accounts identified with this Holocaust loot that they stole from these people after killing them. Cardinal Pell and the Vatican, however, have so far denied the Holocaust victims in accounting. Only further pressure on the Vatican by the international community will have any effect, stated John, stated, stated uh, Mr. Levy here, one of the lead counsels for plaintiffs since 1999. When asked who might take the lead, Levy suggested, quote, there are those at the highest levels of the Serbian, Vatican, and U.S. governments who have personal knowledge, the Eustachia Treasury and its facts. It is time the Vatican, who seeks to bury historical facts, no matter how painful they may acknowledge, to come clean. The canon law petition alleges much of the Eustachia Treasury was recycled through the Vatican Bank to covertly assist CIA-backed Croatian nationalists in their decades-long effort to reestablish an independent Croatian state. So, that was just done the last couple days. And let me tell you this, how this Pope talks out of both sides of his mouth. They're not cleaning anything up. They're just making it appear that way. They're still money laundering like they used to. And I know it for a fact because I remember researching this in depth when they started, when they were money laundering back in the 80s and when it started back in the 60s, and that whole story is you can find on my website and other places. When you talk about one thing, just Google Operation Gladio. So back to Deborah. Now, Deborah, this story really shows you how this man's talking out of both sides of, the, of his mouth, 
And the one thing they want to protect is their gold and their money, correct? That's right, because their God is, is mammon. <laughs> yeah, and, and just check this story out. What's your thoughts on it? I mean, can you imagine, you know, what John is telling us is, look, they're saying that uh, they're cleaning in a house, but they're really not. And I think uh, just I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, they're probably just looking for time to be able to cover up better what they're doing here. But my hat's off to uh, this John Levy gentleman for, for doing this. And whenever anybody really researches what's going on, especially touching the cold, I mean, they're putting their life on the line to do this, as you know. So anyway, uh, yeah, they they got the gold all right when they brought that convoy into the Vatican and, and unloaded there. But I mean, it's unbelievable what they do the murders and the cover-ups and and it's amazing it's really the bible says that satan has the whole world deceived and that's the only way they could possibly get away with all of this well, you're you know you're exactly right and uh what i wanted to say was that uh when you look at you know i remember when i was covering this the the, the case is alperin v vatican bank and it was such a travesty because the Ninth Circuit in in San Francisco uh, just held these, these attorneys hostage in a sense. They had they had damning damning deposition information, clear cut information that the Vatican had taken this money illegally, was involved in the genocide, but yet they couldn't. You know what happened was the Ninth Circuit basically stated to after ten years. Well, we don't want to hear the merits of the case because the Vatican doesn't do business in the United States. Now, is that judge corrupt or what? Yes, Who says it's it? unbelievable that they can just say, I mean, they might as well say Mary had a little lamb. I mean, it's ridiculous <laughs> that the Vatican doesn't do business in the United States. That, that is unbelievable. Right, and that's, that's what they do here. Besides, kill people and shut down churches, and you know, let their will be done all over the place through their mouth, the media. You know, and the interesting thing about this case, what makes John interesting, is that he also has a law license in England, which uh, real makes him. Uh, he's a he can also bring cases to the EU, so he has taken this to every avenue to try to get justice for these people, and he's still being stonewalled by the Vatican Bank, who now says it's transparent, which it isn't transparent. It's a, it's a perfect example. So uh, I just wanted to bring that up. But Deborah, back to what we were talking about. Uh, give us a little bit of a background again. You know, how, you know, I want to get back to the Alamo ministry. You've been there for 40 years. Tell me in a brief, we have about 10, 15 minutes, but tell me really what you saw from the beginning to it to what we're, where we're at today in 2016 with this ministry. It's still thriving, even though the Vatican has tried desperately to just wipe you guys off the map. Tell us how you first started. Just give us a little background, I'm trying to say. Go ahead. Okay, I've been with the ministry since 1970. That's 46 years. And uh, before I became a member of the ministry, and before I became a member of the body of Jesus Christ, I was... Uh, living on near the east coast and i was raised uh by my dad and stepmother uh my stepmother was catholic and i was put in a catholic school for seven years and i was raised taught by nuns and uh my stepmother's side of the family had relatives that were nuns and we would have visits uh they would come every now and then to visit and uh they had higher up people also in, in the Catholic religion. And I was raised that way. I was confirmed. I was baptized into it. I was confirmed. And when they did not have any answers for me as a teenager, uh, there was something that I really wanted to know about. They didn't have an answer. And I decided I didn't want to belong to it anymore. And I didn't want to have to go and tell the priest my sins. I figured it was none of his business and I quit I, I quit completely and I was influenced by an older brother that I had who was 
in college and studying philosophies and psychology and such. And uh, I was influenced in him and I, by him, and I totally quit believing in God entirely, and that was just fine with me because I didn't want to believe in God. I didn't want to believe that there was an afterlife or a heaven or a hell or anything. I just wanted to live my life. And uh, I just very briefly, very slightly uh, got into drugs, almost nothing. But I found out that they definitely weren't the answer. And uh, I wanted to find out what the truth was. I graduated in 1969 from high school, wanted to be a writer, and I ended up going to California from the from New York City, actually. And I went out there. So oh, you're from find- New York? I'm not from New York. I'm actually from Pennsylvania. Okay, go ahead. I I went out there to find the truth, and whatever the truth was, I decided that I wanted to live my life for it. Uh... I figured, why live for a lie? Why not live for the truth, whatever it be? What am I What am I here on earth for? Where did I come from? What am I really here for? It's not just because I was born into a family, but what does that mean? I, nobody had any uh, deep answers for me about what my life was all about and really about the truth. And I rejected uh, what I'd been taught earlier. So I ended up um, in Hollywood, and somebody uh, from Tony Alamo's ministry passed me uh, a leaflet and about their services at eight o'clock every night and I really didn't have any intentions of coming there but someone gave me a lift to a different place I and they I ended up actually quite almost right in front of the Tony's ministry and I walked down the street and there it was and I decided to go in and find out what it was about so I did and I stayed for the services which to me the services were great i didn't have anything against them at all they were at this time you have to remember this was 1970 february 1970 and most many of the people there i'd say most were dressed like hippies and but the thing about it is that they had there was such an excitement there was such a uh something going on there that i didn't really i wasn't i it wasn't it was them, but it wasn't me. I wasn't part of that. And I didn't know they preached the gospel to me. Everybody got up and gave a testimony that night. There must have been maybe 70 testimonies of these young people that had come out of lives of sin and some drugs and some uh, just various different lives. And they found that Jesus Christ was their savior, that he had saved them and changed them. And uh, and they were singing, they would sing these old-fashioned gospel songs that I really hadn't ever heard before. And not anything like the Latin and the uh, mysteries of the Catholic cult, you know, that I had been used to. And I, uh, at the message, Tony himself gave the message. And uh, it was a a powerful message. And it was enough to where the Holy Spirit was there and just dealing with me. And I, they had an altar call. And I got up out of my seat and I went forward. And because I felt, well, either Jesus is the truth or he isn't, but I won't know unless I try this for myself. And so I got down on my knees and I started saying the prayer and actually had to battle off my thoughts of, well, you don't believe in God. What are you doing saying this prayer? But the Lord Jesus Christ put that faith in my heart as everybody has that that little measure of faith. And I asked Christ to come in and wash away my sins and he did that night and he changed my life and he came in and he he forgave me and it was the most wonderful thing to know that my sins really were forgiven Uh, I used to think before I was saved well if there is a God he wouldn't want anything to do with me because I'm a sinner what I didn't have any idea how to get rid of my sins and confessing him to a priest I knew there was no that wasn't the answer and uh, nobody has the power to forgive sins but Christ alone He's the one that shed his blood for our sins. And I was saved, and uh, it was a wonderful ministry, a street ministry there, and it's grown by leaps and bounds. And and, uh, Tony was preaching, not exactly that night or that time frame, but later on he started, when things were opened up to him more and more, he uh, was started preaching about uh, more things that were going on in the Bible, and regarding the book of Revelation and regarding the Vatican and, and the Lord allowed him to see, showed him who the Vatican was, what it really was all about. And uh, he started preaching about the Vatican. But really, honestly.
honestly, I'm telling you, Greg, from the very beginning, our church was always persecuted because when I came to the ministry in 1970, there would be uh, the uh, L.A. Police Department, West Hollywood Sheriff's Department is what it was, would come over and they would raid our church. And, and you were strictly, you church. weren't even talking about the Vatican at that time, just basically preaching the Not gospel, that, right? Right. Not at that time. And they, they, under the guise of looking for runaways, and they would come in and they would throw tear gas in our prayer room and they would beat the brothers. And I mean, it was horrible. And this went on and on and on. And we try to scrape together money to get different ones out of, out of jail that they would put in jail for preaching the gospel. Where was Hollywood this? Boulevard. Right on Hollywood Boulevard, right? Right downtown? Hollywood Boulevard and Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, I know and, where it um, is. I've driven by there. The I've driven by there many times. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, and uh, the shopkeepers with the nude bars and the and the different bars and the drug places you could go to, they didn't like the fact that we were taking the business because people were getting saved and it was a mighty revival and it was going on all over the world. And there were uh, news companies, uh, people from newspapers and also video uh companies that were coming in from all over the world that were filming us. We were in so many magazines and newspapers, and it was a big worldwide phenomenon, and that's something that Tony and Susan started. And uh, as I said then later on, uh, not much later though, and we'd always been through persecution, then they started kidnapping people out of the ministry and deprogramming them, and and uh, then we get slapped with a lawsuit uh, by the Department of Labor, and, and it went on and on, and the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, all the way up until this time. But we then when we, we uh, started preaching to, uh, more and more about the Vatican and about when what we knew what was going on with that, then it, it just snowballed. It was like unbelievable. And up to the point where not only did they put our pastor in prison on false charges for the tax evasion uh, suit back in the early 90s, but then on and on to this. And what their motive operandus were, they would take people that had been kicked out of the church or that had left of their own free will for whatever reason. And they, and they uh, offered them money and they offered them for false testimony. And, oh, you can make money because we're going to sue the ministry and, and on and on. And it's that's the kind of thing that has happened. But I've been with the ministry from the beginning, and I've seen this. And I know, I knew Tony, I knew Susie when she was alive, and I know Tony, and I've known these two very well for decades. And I know that Tony is innocent, and I know that he's in prison because of what he has said, because of the fact that this mini ministry has revealed who the Antichrist is. And not only here, but all over the world, our, our, uh, our pieces of literature that our pastor has written and expose, exposes, exposes have gone all over the world to really just every nation. And so it has been greatly exposed by this ministry. So, of course, Satan is not going to sit back and say, oh, gee whiz, uh, you know, Tony's over there doing this or that. No, he makes sure that he riles up enough people to get our pastor put in prison and for 175 years. Yeah. But God is on his throne and God is more than able to take care of all this. And he will. God's, I put my trust in God a long time ago. I've never seen God fail. People I've seen fail, but I've never seen God fail. And it's amazing, Greg, because over the years you can just see the Bible unfold all these things. If you read the Word, which is what people don't do, they don't read God's Word, which is the Bible. The more of the Bible you read, the more of the mind of Christ you have. And it's amazing the things that have happened that God said would come to pass, and they are happening right now. Yeah, what, and uh, what I find amazing, though, and over the, all the years that I've covered, <laughs> excuse me, covered you guys, is that the ministry's still thriving, even though they've tried everything to get rid of you guys. And it's just amazing to me. I've talked about that in depth on so many uh, occasions. Uh, I got a couple minutes. Tell me some of the real happy moments throughout these forty years that you've spent with the ministry. Uh, we got about two minutes. Go ahead. Well, I'd say 
say some of the best times are just being out on the streets and witnessing and testifying and seeing people uh, accept the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved and come out of lives of sin. Uh, that That's a really happy time for me, just seeing somebody, uh, a soul get saved and changed and uh, become a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think that it really gets much better than that. And then uh, being able to have a service, have a church where people can come and, and uh worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and where they can feel the Holy Spirit, where they can read the Bible, where they can uh, do the works of the Lord, uh, do participate in the works that the Lord Jesus Christ says to do, uh, which would be feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and visiting the sick and in prison and nursing homes and all those parts of the ministry. Those are really the best parts. Those are the, the greatly rewarding parts to me and uh, just being able to listen to our pastor's ministry i greatly admire what he's done his his words are right on his tracks uh, his literature is right on with the word of god and uh he's paid quite a price and i just really am be ha been happy to partake in all of this for many many years praise the lord right and you guys still are at it too so what have you been doing lately well, I've been to these some of these different presidential rallies, distributing literature there down in Houston, down in uh, over in uh, 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 Missouri, St. Louis, and Kansas City, and and other places. And, it's and been going uh, on with one thing I wanted to mention: you still at your ministries are helping people. Still an open door policy, correct? That's right. They sure are. And uh, services every. Uh, Every night in Los Angeles, Hollywood, uh, Los Angeles area, north of uh, Los Angeles, and uh, services in New York and just various places where we have uh, churches. Okay, Deborah, listen, uh, we're all out of time. I want to thank you for coming on, and uh, hopefully we can get you on in the next couple of weeks. Don't be a stranger. And fill me in, uh, email me anytime, fill me in on what the ministry is doing, because I still report on it most uh, every week to let people know that uh, there are people in this country who still believe in the Word of God, uh, despite uh, Satan's activities that are heating up here, so to speak, literally, in America. Yes. Thanks a lot, Deborah, and goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crosstheborder.org.